morning, everybody. So today we are going to have an international presentation. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Carlos Toro, which is senior managing editor in the American Chemical Society journals publishing, right? And <clears throat> he will speak, will, he will give us some tips uh, about publishing, right? Uh, about scholarly publishing. So his presentation will be about this topic. And let me give you an introduction of uh, Carlos Toro. So Dr. Carlos Toro has a bachelor degree in chemistry from La Universidad del Zulia in Venezuela. And he had a PhD in chemistry from University of Central Florida and a postdoc uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry in the University of Maryland. Since 2014, he joined the ACS publications, and he's now, as I mentioned, senior managing editor of, of nine journals of the American Chemical Society, which is the, the, the publishing uh, company that um, publishes the one of several of the most important publications in nanoscience. Uh, so that's why I invited Carlos Toro to talk us uh, a little bit about the tips and, and recommendations on how to publish in these very nice journals they, they are managing. Uh, so thank you very much, Carlos Toro, and you can start your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Gidelli, for the for the invitation. It is it is always a real pleasure to sort of go back home, right? I mean, every time that I yeah. do one of the presentations, I feel like um, I'm, spe I'm I'm speaking to people that I can relate to. Um, as as Professor Eder said, I'm originally from Venezuela, so we are neighbors. Um, can I, I did my undergrad there. It started, I, I, I feel like I have been all over the place. Uh, in Venezuela, I started doing computational chemistry. And then when I started my PhD here in the United States, I became an experimentalist. Um, and even though my degree is in chemistry, I always felt a little closer, I guess, to physics. So I never, I have never made a molecule in my life. Uh, I am an, a sort of an spectroscopist by heart. So I was yeah, using on, uh, lasers, on lasers and nonlinear nonlinear optics uh, to to study the properties of of, of certain materials. Um, and then as a postdoc, I was also doing ultra fast ultra fast laser spectroscopy. So in a sense, I guess I can relate a little bit to sort of many of the challenges, right, that we encounter as a scientist when English is not our first language um the challenge of you know being in a developing country so to speak and and realizing that you want to publish good science but there is always the struggle you now of where to start <clears throat> so as an undergraduate in venezuela i had the experience of publishing four papers uh in in international journals um right i mean maybe I guess not the highest impact, but but I kind of got a sense of of where I wanted to go. Did my PhD, did my postdoc, and I realized that I had a passion for science, um, but I never saw myself as a professor, really. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the the world of publishing kind of offered the best of both worlds to me. I still remain very close to science. Uh, I interact with scientists um, on a regular basis, but I don't get to do the science. <laughs> so I still travel to conferences, talk to scientists all the time, but um, but I don't have to 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 sort of be in the lab on a daily basis. So there is someone pinging me here on a chat. Let me close this for a second. Let me make sure that I don't get apologies about that. So, okay, that's that. So that's sort of a presentation. Let me then share my screen. And if someone please can confirm. So are you yeah. guys seeing my slides? Yep, yeah. yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, All right, seeing. so 
Um, I would like to sort of walk you through uh, what we call this presentation, 10 tips for scholarly publishing, right? And, and, and these are probably, if the audience is composed of graduate students and some maybe faculty members, a lot of these will be things that you already know, um, but it's always to be a reminder, have a little refresher of some of the uh, things that go into getting your paper ready for publication. Um, the first step is naturally, what's the anatomy of a manuscript? And for the most part, I think we can all agree that there are eight components, components to a research article. There's, of course, the title, the abstract, introduction, results, and discussion. Many people kind of split point number four into two, depending. Some journals do ask for these two things to be separated, results and discussion, conclu conclusions, references, and um, supporting graphics, things that you can kind of put in the supporting information and the experimental section. And again, these components sometimes change depending on the journal. Some journals may not ask you to have these, these particular section or these other section. But for the most part, I think we can all agree that this is sort of the bulk, the the the, um, the main body of, of any research article. And there is not right or wrong answer in which, in what order do you need to tackle any of this, right? I mean, every component is as important as possible. Many people say, look, I'm going to start by the abstract and the conclusion, which let me tell you right now, they're not the same thing. Um, people start by the uh, by the title. The important thing is that you do not kind of approach this um, in a rush, right? You have to think about it carefully in what order you want to craft your ideas so that at the end of the day, you have a very compelling story. So here I'm going to walk you one by one each of these tips, and hopefully you'll find some of them um, useful. So the most important part, I guess, or step number one, is to create a useful outline. As scientists, right, we know that what we do on a daily basis comes down to step number one. Collect the data, run the simulations, do the experiment, and really understand what experiments or what simulations are necessary in order to support the hypothesis that you started with, right? That's, that's step number one. And this comes natural to us. We go into the lab, we design sort of the experiments, we design the, the, the sort of um, what is the evidence that we need to collect in order to support our ideas. And along those lines, right, it is, it is important to always ask ourselves the why, the what, and the how. Why am I doing this in the first place? Am I looking to address a new challenge? Am I looking to clarify a dispute that is that there is in, in the literature about X or Y topic? It is important to know why exactly you're doing what you're doing. Um, so the what, what has been done before? Right. I mean, it, it is important to, to ask these kind of questions and the how did I do the right set of experiments or is there another way in which I can uh, provide additional support to, to my hypothesis? Right. The how sometimes it could be limiting. You know that potentially the, the ideal experiment to support X or Y result would be to. I don't know, run synchrotron uh, measurements on your sample. Well, probably you don't have access to a synchrotron radiation source. So the how sometimes it could be limited to what's available to you. But as you are in this process, right, step number one, collecting the data and asking all these questions, you also have to organize the data uh, in terms of this, uh, its relevance, not necessarily chronologically. If you have had any experience of putting together a manuscript, you likely know that you rarely do or you rarely report things in the order that you did the experiments, right? I don't know if it's, if it's happened to you, but typically that last set of experiments are the ones that really bring, um, put everything together. So probably those are the strongest results. Those could probably go first. All these to say that the data needs to be cohesive. It needs to say the right um, 
uh, deliver the right message. So organizing the data in a, in, in a way that it makes sense. <clears throat> I remember my days being in grad school. Figures, I guess, were among the most important things that I took care of first because you are, and I'm going to mention this several times throughout my presentation, you are competing for attention. Right now, we're being bombarded by an in, by an immense amount of information. So how can you make your paper stand out, right? People are going to read your title and look at the figures. If you don't catch their attention there, probably they're not going to read your paper. So make sure that you create, you know, uh, good figures and useful figures always as, as you are you know, once you finalize what your figures are, make sure that people read, you know, where you're heading with this idea of the manuscript. Share the outline with the other co-authors for feedback. And as important, this is not set in a stone, right? This outline is not final per se. It's always um, ideal to go back and review it and make sure that you make the appropriate changes. So don't wait until the last moment to sort of say, okay, this is what I want to do with this manuscript. It's sort of an ongoing process. It is also important to choose your journal. And I now realize that this slide is not up to date. For ACS, for example, we currently have about a portfolio of 75 journals and it's growing. Why? There's always the question, why do we need more journals? Well, there are many reasons, and that's probably another one-hour presentation as to why a publisher always considers another journal. But just think about it. Just for ACS alone, we have probably a good 20 journals in the material science portfolio. So where do you start? When you look at the web of science, that's, that's, that's sort of the, the company that handles the journal impact factor. I believe there are more than 2,000 journals that are indexed in that in that. Um, in that uh, database. So where where do you start? As a, as a brand new author, it's probably overwhelming. So things that you obviously need to consider, is this where the community is publishing, right? You know your community very well. You know who's working in that community. So is this the journal where this, this community will typically publish the work? Is, this, is, is, is the work within the scope of the journal? Manuscript type, it is important to consider, right? Do I have a full length article or this is so new that maybe a letters journal will be better? Just a short format, two to three pages, get it out, get it out of the door. This is important enough that, you know, it is, I, I need to get this out as fast as possible. Uh, what I want to write is a review. Okay, well, many journals obviously publish reviews, but you may want to think about if you want to choose a journal that is just dedicated to reviews. All these factors kind of come into play when you're choosing what journal to publish in. Impact and appeal, obviously, of the audience is important. Uh, we, we all know that, you know, there are journals with very high impact factors, with a very broad scope, with a very high appeal. And then we know that there are journals more dedicated to a niche community. Those are things that you have to take into account as well when choosing a journal. Open access, right? I mean, is your funding agency uh, mandating that you publish open access? And this is especially important right now in Europe, but it's a movement that we are seeing, we're seeing sort of uh, uh, becoming a stronger and stronger and in other places of the world. So also relevant to consider your open access need. Does do I need to make my research openly available right away? And you can also look at you know related research published being in the journal. So always an obvious, a good starting point is as you are writing your manuscript and you are looking at papers that you're going to reference. Look at where those journals, uh, uh, those uh, articles that you are citing. Look at where you're, those are being published. And that will probably give you a good hint of where your paper should be published. This sometimes, this third, the third tip, read and follow the guidelines, looks like a no-brainer. But you would be surprised of how many people miss this tip. Just make sure that you read um, every guideline that is available on the journal. For the ACS, we have all these 
available in what we call the ACS Publishing Center. Take into consideration ethical guidelines. If you're looking at some biological samples, for example, uh, some um, journals have specifics on how to report uh, certain type of information or data uh, regarding biological samples. Um, so many journals give you tips if you are, for example, reporting on efficiencies of a solar cell, right? I mean, there are tips uh, on, on, on specific metrics that you can use in order to report the performance of, 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 of that specific solar cell. So in a nutshell, you do not want to waste your time and you don't want to waste the time of the editorial office, right? There is nothing more frustrating than to, for an author to get the paper back because, oh, you did not comply with the formatting requirements of the journal. So just, it saves everyone time if we do, if we take this one step from the beginning. Uh, so in terms of, you know, it, it, this is very close in connection to preparing the outline. Your paper has to tell a story, right? You have to identify what is the main theme of the manuscript and basically build the whole structure of your paper based on, on this theme. The reader has to walk out after reading the paper with a clear understanding of what the problem is and why it is important to address this specific question. Providing context to prior literature, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, in these days, it's kind of hard to imagine that, you know, you're starting something from scratch. Um, there's probably somebody years ago who kind of thought about this and set certain foundations for your work. So make sure that you acknowledge those that have done previous work on, on this specific area. The conclusions should summarize your main message and the main advanced. And again, uh, people sometimes tend to confuse the conclusions with the abstracts. That they're not the same, right? Um, step number five, it has to provide a sufficient details in experimental um, for others. And <clears throat> probably all of us have encountered this challenge. And there are several reports out there in the literature in terms of there is a crisis of reproducibility in science. And it, it's kind of concerning. Probably many of you have run into the situation of trying to replicate the work that you've found in the literature and you, you just cannot reproduce those results. So make sure that you are sort of keeping the scientific record as complete as possible. So in order for others to be able to replicate your work. Analyze the data as thoroughly and as objectively as possible. That's kind of a no-brainer. Make sure that you have the right balance of data. Just because you ran 30 experiments, that doesn't mean those 30 experiments are going to end up in the paper. So this is where you start thinking what could go potential in the, in the supplementary information. And out of those 30 experiments, what are, what are, which ones are the ones that are really going to bring uh, home the message and, and support the theme of your story. And obviously try to avoid acronyms uh, with, a, with a few exceptions, right? For example, DNA, like everyone probably in science can recognize what DNA is. But uh, these days we have so many acronyms uh, in the literature that are specific to a field that it, it doesn't help anyone um, if, if we make um, excessive use of these acronyms. Related to telling a story, it is important to avoid maybe some common language pitfalls. And again, being being uh, English not being my native language is something that I kind of still struggle with. Um, I, I realized early on as I was uh, doing my PhD and my postdoc that my writing style is very different to the style you have to write in science. It has to be simple, concise, and clear. In my writing, I tend to just, you know, sort of decorate the sentences a lot. And, you know, it takes me a lot of words in order to get the message that I want to 
um, bring across. And, and those are things that you need to avoid. So in my experience, for example, it is it's very common. Basically, that means you just did it once. It has long been known. I didn't even bother to look at the reference. So these are just a few examples of things that you need to consider and potentially avoid when writing a manuscript. Like I said, there are some components that are very, very, very important to a manuscript. One is the title and also the, the, the graphics that go into the paper. And also, I'm going to speak a little bit about what it's called the, the table of content image. But in this case, uh, tip number five is to make sure that you draw your graphics with a lot of care. So graphics should help the reader comprehend, comprehend the story that you're trying to tell. Like I said before, the graphics need to be clear and precise. Uh, you don't want to clutter too many information into one graphic. And one thing to keep in mind always is that being sloppy with your images kind of send the wrong message to the editor, right? Because as, a, as an editor, as a handling editor, the, the editor might receive the paper and say, just think, right? Probably just, and, and, and we are kind of inserting bias with that, that, that might hurt us uh, in the long run. It's like, if the authors did not care to prepare good graphics, what makes me think that there was enough care put into the actual experiments or data collection? Probably not the case. Maybe this is, this is a, 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 a big extrapolation, but things that should be avoided in order for the, for the paper to be considered um, by, for the science and not necessarily because of um, you know, the way it looks. <clears throat> so figures should contain real data and, again, support your story. Make sure that you can use color. For example, at ACS, we do not charge for color use. I know some publishers still charge for that. But basically, we are in a online um, dates right now that we can use colors as much as, as we would like, and, and we don't charge for that. So make sure that colors support you know, um, the, the, the figures that you are putting together. At the same time, the graphics must be original and unpublished work. There is an exception to that, to that recommendation is, for example, sometimes you are, you, you are invited to write a review or a perspective. So basically you are pulling uh, graphics from others papers previously published. If that is the case, that is acceptable. Of course, you can reuse figures from other papers, but you have to make sure that you secure the appropriate permission uh, for data reuse. Sometimes uh, one aspect that authors fail to realize is that once the paper is published, most likely the corresponding author, your advisor, signed uh, what it's called a journal publishing agreement. And basically now the copyrights of that work is transferred to the publisher, ACS in this case. So it's not, it's not good enough to say, I'm going to reuse this paper because it's also a paper of mine. I can use this data whenever I want. Basically, once the paper is published, most likely the copyright is now with the publisher and publishers are more than happy to give you permission to reuse the data. It's just that you need to comply with that step of making sure that at the bottom of the caption, you say reproduced with permission of, and you put the proper citation. And because we are scientists and that's what we do, we have to make sure that our graphics uh, include error analysis if, if that is um, you know, appropriate. And here is a perfect example of what not to do. Um, this is, as you can see, it's one figure, A, B, and then you can see that, you know, within B, you have labels for carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and iron, and then A has a different panel, C, D, E. Basically, the author here mixed several techniques several measurement types is it's it it honestly hurts 
our eyes to look at this image, I cannot possibly understand what the author wants to say in this image. So if, if the format allows it, it's much better to sort of break this data down in maybe one or two, in probably two or three figures, if, if possible. But this is just way too convoluted. Um, if, I, if I am a reader and I look at, say, panel A, I have to really squint at the screen to say, what was that, five millimeters, five nanometers? I can't really tell. Like, I'm wearing glasses. I can barely see what the scale in each of those graphs are. So just make sure that there, you provide as much clarity as possible. Tip number six, attract the readers with the title and a TOC graphic. Super, super, super important. I mentioned this sort of in slide number one. But basically, we are every day receiving so much information. Your emails are getting, um, you know, bombarded every minute with, you know, new papers, new TOCs, alerts from different journals, uh, you know, Whatever tool you use, Google, it doesn't matter how you get to your information. There is just an excessive amount of information. So as you move uh, through your day, kind of running your experiments, and how do you choose what papers to read? Think about it. Just remove yourself from one second. Don't, don't think about yourself as an author. Think about yourself as a reader. What attracts me to read a paper? Maybe a very compelling title, a very interesting title that, that catches your attention. Um, very nice, beautiful figures. That gets you hooked, and that gets you to read the abstract. That gets you to read the conclusion, and that then gets you to read the full paper. So think about it now. Put again your author hat. What are the things that I need to do in order for a reader to read my paper? Uh, create a very strong title. So uh, there is kind of this rule of thumb uh, um, in, in the publishing world that typically a very strong title has no more than 20 words and make sure that they're grammatically sound, of course. The title needs to uh, select very strong action verbs and avoid the overuse of adjectives and adverbs and things like that. Um, the science need to speak for itself. And that's what we mean by avoiding the use of adjective. Uh, for the first time, unique, superb performance. No, no. Let the reader choose if the performance is superb. Let the, let the reader choose if the, if the reaction you are reporting is unique, if the properties um, that you are reporting are exceptional. Those, those, those kind of adjectives have no place scientific writing for everybody is what is called a uh, search engine optimization right google is pretty good at this so make sure that you choose words that you know when people put you know certain words that kind of triggers google to put your article at the top and again avoid buzzwords acronyms and abbreviation as possible and uh Obviously exaggerating here, but uh, just make sure that you stick to the science and to the conclusions of your paper. And again, TOC graphics. And I realize now that maybe maybe not all journals do have a TOC graphic. If the journal does offer TOC graphics, and most ACS journals do, as a matter of fact, probably all of them, just just take advantage of that. Right. So. Step number one, how do we get started? So write for yourself one or two sentences that are sort of the key main message of your, of your article. And obviously take a look again. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't mention this enough to, to the examples in the guidelines. And then this TOC graphic has to be a good connection between the title of your paper and, and um, this, this image that you are preparing. So 
make sure that you know it is informative and fits in a rectangle. Be creative, but at the same time, you don't have to just uh, uh, is is not is serious, right? You want to be creative. You want the image to to attract the reader and 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 compel the main message of the paper. But at the same time, it's not it's, it's not the opportunity for you to get goofy. And this this kind of calls to the artistic side of many authors, and we understand that not everyone has a good artistic uh, skills. But try to do your best, right? One one main tip is if you, for example, has an X Y graphics as part of your paper. Do not use that graphic as part of your TOC image. It's just it just doesn't look nice. You are missing the opportunity again of catching the attention of a reader. And these the TOC has to be original. Why? Because different than a typical figure in a paper, right? Every figure in a paper, you have the opportunity to to add a caption. And if by any chance you don't own the copyright of that image, you can say reproduce with permission of X, Y, or Z. In the table of graphics, that one doesn't have a caption. So you cannot use images for you for which you don't own the copyright. So that's why we asked the author that the TOC graphic has to be original, uh, an original design by the author. Tip number seven, again, this, this one speaks about the ethical component of scientific publishing and is to avoid plagiarism. And we encounter plagiarism and related issues, self-plagiarism. I talked a little bit about this. Oh, I wrote this paper. Therefore, I can reuse this full paragraph from a paper that I published before. That's self-plagiarism, right? And, and again, once the paper is published, published, most likely you don't own the copyright of that work. So avoid self-plagiarism as much as possible. We understand that there are probably obvious places in which uh, there's not many ways, many ways in which you can rewrite this content. Experimental part. Probably that's the technique that is used in your lab. So it is okay for the, the, for um, having some overlap in the experimental part. But when it comes to results and discussion, introduction, um, you are not you are not supposed to just take previous content published, um, even from your own work. Prior publication, obviously, submitting the same paper to two journals at the same time that's a big no no. Um, and then here, as throughout the presentation, you can see some resources that you can take a look at if you want to know more about. Um, things that you can do to avoid plagiarism. And tip number eight, it's, it's sort of a reminder that always revised, edit, and rework. Um, a good manuscript goes through several drafts, and revisions are an important part of the process. So make sure that you know all your co-authors read the manuscript, give them enough time to provide feedback. And um, if the paper goes through peer review, this is also a good opportunity for you to just... Um, Always make the paper better, right? Um, so always keep that in mind. Supplementary information, that would be tip number, ten, uh, tip number nine. It's to prepare the supplementary information with care. Make sure that is data that supports, further supports the claims that you're making in the main body of the paper. Um, it is a perfect opportunity to provide as many experimental details as possible. Um, right now, uh, in these current times, many authors are providing uh, videos, actually, right? I mean, with the, now the inventions of the GoPro cameras, we have seen some groups that, you know, the graduate students start wearing a GoPro camera while doing the experiments. So it's very easy when they, when they refer to there is a change in color in the reaction. So now it's very visible. We can see exactly what the author refers to when they say there is a change of color in the reaction or certain experimental conditions are easily visible by, by using um, video. So take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> a cover letter, it's a very important part of the whole process. The manuscript is ready for submission. 
typically the 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 professor, the advisor, the the principal investigator is the responsible for submitting the paper, not not all the time. The student at, and the postdoc can do it as well. But this is where you address the editor in chief of the journal directly. You tell them what the name of the manuscript is and the journal, you know, be make sure that you get the, the name of the journal right. Explain why, why the journal is the appropriate venue for your work and be concise. What is the main message of your of your paper? People tend to rush this, and this is probably your only opportunity to really convey to the editor why your paper should be considered for publication in this journal. So make sure that you spend enough time in this part of the process. So here, I know that I probably went relatively fast in many of these topics. So uh, there are some additional key resources here that you can um, consider or take a look at for, for more information about um, tips on, 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 on preparing a scientific manuscript for publication. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time, um, and I'll be happy to, happy to answer uh, any questions. And I'm going to stop sharing here. That should take me back to the main. Yep, here we are. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you very much, Carlos Toro. And I will have some minutes for questions. So if you have any question, the audience have any question, please send us. Um, I'd like you uh, to, to tell us a little bit more if you have, I don't know, maybe some more available slides about the difference between abstract and conclusions, because this is a, a very common problem that we face when uh, we are writing a manuscript. So I'm not yeah. sure if you have this. So, 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 the abs the, so the abstract, right, you have to tell, you have to tell the reader in a very short, in a very short amount of words, what the problem is you're tackling, how you tackled it, right? And the main conclusion of the paper, sort of the main, the main thing that that that, um, that you found out after, you know. Uh, so basically, it answers those three questions that I talked about: the why, the what, and the how. Um, so that's the abstract, right? In the conclusion, basically, you just jump straight at it and describe to the reader what the main finding of the paper is. And this is your one opportunity to probably um, go a little bit further in terms of what are the potential implications of, of you know, what you are reporting in that manuscript. So just by reading the abstract, the reader has to understand the why, the what, the how, the conclusion, you're probably just will focus your attention on what exactly, the what, you accomplished in the paper. Should we bring a little bit of the result in the abstract, like just to... to, to exactly, the... you just, right. But 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 um, at the same time, you don't want to just overuse too much jargon to say, I don't know, let me see. Um, I'm not too much of an expert uh, at, at organic synthesis, but say, you came up with a molecule that has potential. Again, I'm just going to use the cancer example. Um, it's a potential candidate, right? But you're not going to go in the abstract and say, and I used NMR, and IR, and I used UV visible, and I used this, and I used this. It's like, no, those, those probably the person can find in the details of the paper, right? But you can okay. tell them exactly what was the main finding of your paper which is we prepared a candidate molecule that so far showed this performance, of the, I don't know, towards like okay. killing cancer cells, right? That's, that's the punchline. That will get the author to say, ooh, the reader to say, ooh, okay, I'm more interested to see what exactly they did. Yes. Nice, very nice. Thank you very much. And also mm -hmm. in the conclusion, I think it's important to to reinforce that you should tell the implications, right? Um, Absolutely, because yeah. that leaves the door open to the reader to say, "Oh, this is where they're headed." 
there is always this balance of like, oh, I might get scooped, right? I mean, someone is going to do it before me. But this right. is how science sort of moves forward, right? I mean, these are your findings and you think these are potential implications of your work. And it's also very fine to say where your group is heading in terms of the next steps, right? Where would you like to take this research forward? Great, great. Thank you. So we have now some questions from the audience. So congratulations for the presentation. If the article has already been published, what is the best way to request a change in work? So if the article has already been published, what is the best way to request a change in work? So let me see if I understand that. After the paper is published, the author found that there are things There's that need to... So typical. So, uh, journals at ACS, at least, and I'm, I believe this is true in, uh, for most publishers as well. We have a mechanism that is called addition correction. Right? I mean, oops. Uh, I don't know. There is a typo in the labels. Uh, the caption I said it was ten millimolars, and it was fifteen millimolars. Um, an addition correction typically should not change the conclusions of the manuscript, right? Uh, oh, you know, there is a typo in this formula. Anything more major than that will potentially lead to a retraction, right? I mean, if the conclusions are no longer valid, in order to safeguard the scientific record, it is much, it is better to sort of retract that manuscript. Look, the data was invalid. Uh, there are ethical issues. Ooh, there was data manipulation. Um, we can no longer reproduce the results, so we prefer to uh, uh, retract the paper. So it really depends on what level of change based on, on this person's question. What are we talking about change? Is there, oh, we found out a minor error in the paper that we can address to an addition and correction. If that change that we're talking about, it's a major thing and it changes the conclusions of the paper, then we need to have, we need to have a different conversation. Okay. So we hope that like answers the question. Technical in terms of um, point of publications, like a, a graph that it was duplicated in the manuscript that happens also once to me. <clears throat> so it's possible <laughs> to do a, a small correction, right? Exactly. Do not change in anything about the publication. Otherwise, that doesn't change the conclusion totally of the paper. Change it. Okay, great. It's very clarifying. So, in the graphic abstract, is it always necessary to use the same graph as the article? I, I, I'd say in the article, right? Or it's more recommended to make a new one? I think our recommendation is always to make a new one. This is this is your one chance to be an artist. Uh, <laughs> Of course, I mean, if if you have if you have a very nice, compelling, what can I say? I mean, there are so many beautiful techniques out there right now. If you look at elemental analysis, I think right now you can get all these colorful signals from iron and, and phosphorus and sulfur. Maybe you can use that as a background, and just, just this is your one chance to get creative. Um. What I again, what I do not recommend is that you, if you just have a plot of property X versus property Y and just just a linear a linear relationship, that is that is not very attractive. Uh, so, we recommend the authors to be as creative as possible and to make it a brand a brand new TOC graphics. Great. So, a professional question. How do you manage it to work in ACS? What is the path to work with publications? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, that speaks a little bit of sort of about alternative careers. Um, like I said, um, very passionate about science. Uh, you know, sometimes I attend a conference and I can't help myself but to say, oh, man, I wish I was in the lab again <laughs> doing those experiments. But um did my PhD, did my postdoc, and I realized, again, I, I never saw myself 
I never saw myself uh, running a lab. What one typically when we are in the middle of grad school don't realize is that we are developing transferable skills. And what I mean by that is like out of my postdoc, I thought that I was really good at aligning a laser cavity. It's like, give me a femtosecond laser cavity and I think I can make a good job at aligning that you know, laser and make it to lace and have very high power, high power energies out of this laser. How is that any good in scientific publishing? So to be fully honest with you, I have not touched a laser in years. That's not exactly the skills that I'm using right now. What do we learn? Problem solving, critical thinking, you know, um, the ability to sort of pivot quickly. This approach is not working. Okay, so let me try another way. That's what we do in science every day, right? We kind of pivot. We set out to tackle a hypothesis. We think this is the best set of experiments to do it. It doesn't work. We go back to the drawing board. So critical thinking, problem solving, that you can apply to almost every job. So just to precisely ask, answer the question, one or two years into my postdoc, I realized that publishing, so putting the papers together, I enjoyed a lot. I remember when it was paper writing time, it's like, oh, fun. And I thought it was like a puzzle. Let me see this figure first, this figure second. No, it doesn't make sense. I think this is the right order. So recognizing what are the things that you enjoy, right? Scientific, the scientific writing is something that I really enjoy. And then the networking part, right? Making sure that you approach people, you ask people. Um, many times within our job, right now in ACS, you know, I get contacted once in a while. Hey, and it's called what it's called informational interviews. A students asking me, hey, how does scientific publishing look like? Walk me through your day. What does a day at ACS look like? You got to talk to the people, right? I mean, and of course, you have to first overcome. If you're shy, you have to kind of overcome that barrier. But networking, basically, I knew one person that was an editor for one of the journals. They got me in contact with someone at ACS. And um, the part that I did not say is that I was able to get this job the third time. <laughs> I applied for one journal. Oh, no, it was too late. They had chosen another person. Okay. I applied for a second journal. Um, I went through the entire interview process. And no, I didn't make it. <laughs> so I applied for a third journal. Okay, finally, I got it. It was a much better fit. I have to admit that I would have been a little uncomfortable the first two times because those were not journals probably in my area of expertise. So um, recognizing, one, that you are gaining a lot of skills, even if you don't realize it, good skills in terms of managing, you know, people sometimes. I mean, if you're responsible for, if you're a postdoc and you're responsible for a certain group of students, you don't realize it, but you are already gaining managerial skills there, right? I mean, um, going back to the point of critical thinking, problem solving, that, that becomes very valuable then in the job market. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the next question, do you think there's a prejudice based on the origin or type of university in the reviewer's evaluation? Many reviewers complain about the English and after reviewing, sometimes very few errors are found. Yeah, oh man, this is, this is a good one and a common one. Coming from Latin America, I also had the same concerns, obviously. Um, the papers not being sent out for for <coughs> I'm sorry for peer review, not even passing the editor to begin with. Uh, we at ACS we try our best to sort of to our other editors make an effort. Uh, they're practicing scientists like you guys are. They papers also get rejected as well. So we don't look at the country of origin where the paper is coming from in order to make a decision. That's not part of the decision process. At the same time, I don't want to 
fool ourselves. I mean, once the paper goes out for peer review, are there prejudices? Probably. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be blind to that reality. But for the most part, I would say with lots of confidence, probably 98%, 99 of the sort of the, 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 the people in science and the ones that are doing the peer review understand that the country or the region where the work originated has nothing to do with the quality. Um, the language barrier is there. That one, it's hard, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to overcome. Um, so always take it with a grain of salt, right? I mean, when a reviewer suggests that, you know, the, 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 the language needs to be improved, um, you know, take that with, to, <laughs> with, the best, with the best intentions, I think, uh, and, and try to, because the reality is, and I've heard, I've heard these from, from, many, from many people, even people for which English, if their native language, it doesn't matter if you were born in the U.S. or in the U.K. and English is your native language. If you don't, wa- if you don't write consli- concisely and precisely, it doesn't, it doesn't do you any good if you're a native speaker, right? From the reader's perspective, is the message clear? Do I understand in one go what the, what the authors are trying to say? So the next question, can you comment a little on choosing either open access or not when selecting journal for submitting your paper? Great presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it all comes down, it all comes down to, I guess, two factors, right? One, do you simply want to make your paper open access and you have the resources to pay for it, right? I mean, there are are charges associated with that. that's one, open access by choice, right? I mean, you choose to make your, your paper open access. Or simply, <laughs> you are being mandated, right? The, your funding agency is saying, we are paying for this. This is tax uh, payers' money. It has to be available to everyone. That's a little bit, that's a little bit of sort of what uh, the philosophy of, of, uh, of Plan S in Europe, I, I'm sure many of you have heard about that. It's like, and, and a little bit, it's, it's something that is gaining traction here in the U.S. as well. This is taxpayers' dollars. Therefore, the science and the outcome needs to be available to everyone. So if it's either by choice or it is mandated, that kind of varies a little bit of where you choose to publish. There used to be the perception, right, that open access meant bad quality. Remember back in the day, probably 10, 15 years ago, oh, you're just, you're just paying to publish your paper. So publishers are going to accept anything and therefore quality is going to be low. So there was this kind of uh, biased perception that open access meant bad quality. That's no longer the case, right? I mean, open access, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, mainstream, mainstream right now. Everyone, every publisher, it's going to have... Um, an open access uh, framework. Many journals are hybrid, in which case they mean you can buy open access if you want, but at the same time, those journals are by subscription or there are pure gold open access journals. So completely open access. So choosing what journal to go to heavily depends on what your situation is, is, for example. Plan S, just to give you an example, Plan S currently being implemented in Europe by several countries. Authors can no published in a hybrid journal. That is, even if you pay open access, there are certain exceptions, but even if you pay open access because of the fact that it's a hybrid journal, that doesn't comply with their mandates. It has to be a fully gold open access journal. So probably that's why you guys have seen many publishers now launching this just open access journal, including ACS, right? Because we have to make sure that our authors have the opportunity to still publish with us and not be penalized by their funding agencies. Nice. So I have a question um, in this in this same topic. So I would like to 
to know if is there any conversation or or any idea about an internal politics maybe in ACS or any other uh, uh, any other company right to mm -hmm. incentivate uh, researchers from emerging countries to publish open access because we are facing a very difficult time because the publication fees are really really expensive for us that are not paying or receiving yeah. in dollar or in euros right so yeah. for example usually a fee for open access publication is around two thousand dollars for example which is translated to almost a year of a of a phd fellowship so our phds would receive a year of salary and with just one paper open access just right? one paper open access right so it's different. I, I would say that in US and, and, and maybe in Europe, it's not so that expensive. It's okay because it's like a one month of salary around of that, right? But for mm -hmm. us in emerging country, countries, it's getting really, really difficult to, to pay these fees. Yeah, and, and it's something that we obviously understand, right? I mean, uh, we at ACS, we offer, for example, several discounts, if the if the if the institution say university uh, subscribes to some of our journals, there is a discount for that. Um, if the author is a member of ACS, there is also a discount for that. But the reality is that there is a lot of pressure, right, on the emerging markets. How you are absolutely right. I don't think I have any argument to say how how did you justify open access for one paper when that actually means the salary of a person for almost a year. So yeah. um, the reality is that the open access market is probably growing fast enough that we may see some reductions in the prices of open access. And, and certainly every publisher is making an effort because the the um right the, the the subscription model i guess it's it's kind of getting you know we, we're gonna find a right balance between subscription model and open access model and it's gonna become more and more apparent that open access it's sort of the way many governments are, are gonna push moving forward so that will probably lower some of the some of the uh, prices for for open access we also have repositories, right? I mean, and probably many of you have heard of Chem, Chem Archive. Um, the physics community has been doing this for a while with Archive. Um, it's another way to sort of comply. Um, some, some funding agencies allow authors to comply with open access just by posting their initial manuscript in a in a repository like that so it, it's another option but I, but i'm 100 100 there with you it's it's hard it's hard yeah. for the latin american market for example possibilities of charging for example the, the as a fee right the charging as month salary of this the country like pretty much like the salary of the the PhD. So, for example, in Brazil, mm -hmm. we would pay two thousand five hundred around that reais. That would be seven hundred dollars around that. So mm -hmm. maybe it would be easier for us to pay, like not yeah. not not specifying in dollars, but maybe in the 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 country, the local currency, Absolutely. the local currency. Not not only in the local currency, but in the the salary of a PD, for example. That the, exactly the, mm -hmm. probably the yeah. one that we produce the science. Exactly. So no, no possibility of this or have I mean, never been. No, no, it's it's yeah, it's being it's being discussed constantly, discussed. right? Constantly, <laughs> because I mean. The same happens if you extrapolate the conversation to Africa, right? I mean, there's, there's how, yeah, how can you? It's it's hard, right? So so those conversations are always on the table because we have to make sure that we give every author the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not easy though. <laughs> yeah, it's it not depends. Easy, right? It depends on variables that probably go beyond our control. So. Okay, so that's it. I think we are finishing right now. Uh, 
So I'd like to thank you everybody for watching us and thank you Carlos Toro for this very, very nice presentation and actually very useful and helpful for us. And thank you and see no, thank you. you. Thank week. you again for the invitation. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.